Everybody remembers hearing that. We're a very small community. We have about 200 folks for about two square miles. And uh, we are actually about 15 miles east of where the very first well that, that Gary was talking about, where the, where the test well was for the, the current hydraulic fraction technology with the, uh, with the water, the slick water. And so, since we're right on the edge of the urban sprawl, we're also uh, a very popular pipeline route out of the Barnett Shale. And so the gas that they're taking out of the ground at Gary's house very likely goes through Dish. So we're home to uh, 11 transmission lines, and these lines are 36 inches or larger. So, you know, that's, that's a pretty good size line. And there's spider webs all throughout our, our community. And each one of those have a 100 foot easement set up very similar to the power lines that you guys out have out here. They can't have anything on that easement ever. You can't grow a tree, uh, just shallow growing crops or grass or something like that. Now, right at our southern border, just outside of our corporate limits, literally feet outside of our corporate limits, they started building a compression station and a treatment facility. Now we all know that this stuff doesn't come out of the ground as the cleanest burning hydrocarbon. It has to go through a process to get to that state. It also doesn't come out smelling like gas, like the natural gas you get in your house. It, it, it has to be odorized. And all of that takes place in ditch. So we are now home to 11 natural gas compression stations installed by five individual companies. Now, Sherelle talked a little bit about the permit by rule. Permit by rule is I declare that I'm not going to put more than this much emissions into the air. Sign a piece of paper, send it purely administrative. Um, each of these five companies filed individual permit by rules, and the site is essentially one site. So, for example, volatile organics as Cheryl was talking about, 25 tons per year. Well, our site puts out well over twice that if you combine all of these sites together. And so that's a loophole, and fortunately TCQ is trying to do something about it. Uh, haven't seen a whole lot that impresses me with TCQ, and so the more I learn, the less impressed I get. But so we had this, this massive compression station, and Gary said that drilling companies, uh, the cities have the right to police that. Um, it's not so with pipeline companies, and each one of these compressors are installed by a pipeline company. So let's say XTO is the driller here, and you sign a lease with XTO, a pipeline company doesn't have to abide by that lease because they're not XTO. And they have a right of eminent domain. And the cities have very little regulatory authority over them. The only thing that we can legally do, essentially, is aesthetics and noise. And, you know, maybe nuisance. Nuisance type stuff. Other than that, the cities that don't have very much much effect. Uh, outside of DISH, all of the compressors are out in the open. We finally got them to install sound walls. Uh, as they move, we've got a couple that are inside of the town now. They're completely enclosed and have fencing around in the bushes and things like that. Uh, when they, when they just, just a rundown, we have 11 compressors, 11 pipelines, we have about 18 wells, we have four metering stations, we have three uh, glycol dehydration units that removes the impurities. We have a sweet uh, sweetener, a mean sweetener, which is all processing equipment, so it's essentially a refinery. Uh, when the, the processing started, the odor really became very bad. And this isn't your natural gas smell. It's a, a boiling glycol smell. And uh, so it causes you a lot of uh, respiratory issues and things like that. We called our state regulatory agencies, which initially I thought it was a railroad commission, and then later on I found out it was TCQ. Uh, frankly, 
A year ago, neither one of them knew exactly what their role in this was. And so, neither one of them would do anything to help us, to give us any relief. And so, uh, being the leader of the community, I, I felt we had to do something. And so we performed our own airstrike. And we went and we spent, you know, 15% of our little budget to, to do a, a pretty pretty comprehensive air study around focus solely on this natural gas compression facility. We did some upwind, some downwind, etc. And we found a lot of problems. We found 16 chemicals that were above the effect screening levels that uh, that they spoke about earlier. And these are carcinogens and neurotoxins. Everybody knows what a carcinogen is, right? Causes cancer over long-term exposure. So we found a number of those chemicals and we released that data. And we were the first ones to release that data on such a, uh, such a broad uh, broad uh, air, air study. And not only did we release it, we publicized it. We let everybody know what was going on because we, we spent the money but we wanted to help other people and we wanted to get away from people to know exactly what was going on. And so that study got a great deal of attention. And, you know, uh, for two years I was trying to get TCEQ to come out and do something and couldn't get them out there. But a week after we released the results of our air study, I couldn't throw a rock without hitting two of them. <laughs> and so they were, uh, they were out there and they've been out there. Uh, I'm still not convinced that things have improved that greatly. Uh, we had installed a permanent monitor. The accuracy of that permanent monitor has come into question. Um, and I know that we've got to move on, so I won't, I won't, I won't keep uh, part of me. I'll try to move along here. Um, as stated, there's a lot of technology that could prevent these problems. You know, they use the cheapest technology that they can find, and, you know, dehydration units. They have zero emission dehydration units. There's other technology that they can install where they wouldn't be uh, causing such a problem with the others. And a lot of, the, a lot of these, this technology actually saves uh, saleable products, like Shirell um, spoke about, and that is money that goes into the, to the, to the company's profits. Um, a dehydration unit, or a, uh, they say that a vapor recovery unit will pay itself off in something like three years. And the, the technology is actually getting cheaper. So there's, there's other stuff that's being developed to, to uh, combat some of these problems. And the CEOs of the major energy companies said that they could not justify installing this to their, to their shareholders without it being mandatory. So to spend the money up front for that, they couldn't justify that to the shareholders. They're simply working on the next quarter's profit. They're not worried about three years down the road. They're working on the next quarter. So Gary talked about setbacks. Uh, in DISH, we still have a thousand foot setback. When we put in that thousand foot setback, the local landman said that he would comply with our ordinance when the court said he had to comply with it, the ordinance. So they did what they did. They drilled around our town, and then it came time for them to come and drill and ditch. And I told them, you will get your permit when the court says you get your permit. They drilled three wells in complete compliance with our ordinance. They did not get one variance. Complete compliance. Thousand foot setback and everything. A thousand foot was the most that we thought we could get away with. As Gary said, they're pretty quick to let you know how many lawyers they have worked for. A thousand foot ain't that much when you're looking at a 150 foot tower and all the equipment that goes around. But this stuff does need to be set back. I think 600 feet is too close. I think a thousand foot is your minimum setback. So, as they said earlier, we uh, and I'm not sure are they if they're actively leasing around here or not. But if not, they probably will be. And when they start actively leasing, they're going to come over here and they're going to find somebody. 
who's popular. They're going to find the president of the local uh, neighborhood association or the homeowners association. They're going to go, got a deal for you, buddy. You see all these people in here? You get them all signed up, you get 2% of all of their minerals. So if one of your neighbors just seems to be particularly interested in you signing this over, there may be a reason why. So I've traveled out to the East Coast, and out in, out in Pennsylvania they have a lot of water issues. And I, I said, you know, there's, there's ways to control the emissions on the air. There's ways that you can prevent a lot of the things that happen in DISH. I'm not sure what you can do with water, and I'm glad that we don't have water problems here. And so, about a year and a half ago, a well was drilled just outside of our corporate limits. They drilled just outside so they don't have to comply with the order. So we have a thousand foot setback. Well, the home that this came from is about, I don't know, 300 feet or so inside of our building. So this is four or 500 feet away from the home. It's where the gas well is drilled. They drill three wells, they frack the wells, the wells start producing, and they start getting sediment in the water. Dish, Texas. This is a private water well in Dish, Texas. And uh, you know, Professor? And uh, yes, yes, and, and that's another thing with 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 water, especially in the rural areas. Most everybody uh, is on a private well, and that's your main source. Uh, and essentially, if you don't have water, your property's worthless. But so this starts getting some sediment. In it. Now this family has two small children. Um, I don't know, four and eight, or four and ten, something like this. And uh, wife complains to the husband. Husband gets tired of the complaining, so he goes to Home Depot and buys one of these paper filters. Those are filter systems. Um, it's like you see on these uh, these above ground pools that you can buy at Walmart. Just a paper, just pull that set. So uh, it worked. Took out all the set for about another nine months, and then. I get a phone call, they say, you gotta come see this. It had completely clogged up their water system. You know, when you turn on the water in the house, nothing comes out. So they pulled about 15 pounds of sediment out of the tank on their well. There's a pressurized tank. I'm not sure if you're familiar with water wells or not. There's a pressurized tank. Um, they didn't want to spend the $500 or $1,000 that they would have taken to test that water. So their children were drinking that water for about nine months. So the Railroad Commission, which is notorious for not finding anything, actually came out and did a test on that water. And the town has done some tests. The Railroad Commission actually found some things. They found arsenic at seven and a half times the allowable limits. They found lead at 22 times. There's barium, chromium. Uh, some of that stuff is naturally occurring, so the first thing that you're going to hear is that that was naturally occurring. There's a substance in there called methyl blue active substance that is not made, uh, it, it, it's man-made. It, it, yes, yeah, it's, it's not naturally occurring. And it's known to be used in the drilling process, fracking process, etc. So, I've been around the country and I've seen this happen everywhere. There's a, there's a natural gas field. I've never seen that outside of a natural gas field. They will tell you that it happens all the time. No one's been able to show me even one example of that happening where there's not 